Morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well. As you can see, I'm here with uh, out in the field with some dogs. My dog's not here, but I I've got. Come here. Come here. Oh, that's a nice one. Anyway, I hope you're doing well. Um, yeah, so I, I'm teaching another class uh, this quarter uh, live, but um, it, it, since you're, we're teaching live, we're meeting live, uh, we all have to wear masks. And uh, it's a little difficult, I think, um, not seeing people's expressions, especially not seeing the professor's expressions and, and knowing when I'm trying to tell a joke or trying to be funny. So uh, even though we're on Zoom, at least uh, you can see what uh, my intentions are <laughs> when it comes to humor or lack thereof. So eh, could be worse. Anyway, hope you're doing well. Um, I guess we'll spend a couple of minutes just kind of reviewing the uh, logistics of the course and then we'll uh, continue with our discussion. All right. So let's do that. Here we go. Um, so all that stuff in the beginning, uh, you know, um, uh, again, uh, the best way to contact me is certainly through email, but please do contact the, uh, the TAs first. There's a lot of folks in the class, um, so uh, it's best that you contact them. If they can't answer a question, they will quickly forward it to me or tell you to contact me and I will get back, I promise. Um, syllabus is up. Uh, you know about the reading. Um, again, let me just emphasize that that optional class reader, actually, I, I haven't put it up yet. Um, I'll put it up uh, this week, promise. Um, that um, is very optional in the sense that um, I, I'm a little hesitant to recommend it because it's uh, made up of some fairly technical readings. It's basically the readings where I got much of the lecture material from. Um, but I know some of you do like to have a, an opportunity to look at the uh, readings um, that are related to the lectures, and that's perfectly fine. I just don't want you to think you're going to be responsible for the details in the readings that is not that are not covered in the lecture. The, the tests are completely derived from the lecture material and the discussion section material, and that's that's all you'll really need to to have to worry about in terms of the content material. Um, I cannot add or drop. Um, I haven't been asked over the last week, so I, hopefully that that I guess that's gone through. To you folks, you understand that everything needs to be done through the student advisors and they'll take care of you if uh, you're trying to do either of those things with the course and there's room. Um, very quickly, the course requirements, just to remind you, are these three multiple choice exams. Those are the only uh, grades of the course. There is no extra credit. Um, each test is worth uh, about a third of your grade. Um, the reason why I say it's about or it's roughly is because what we just do is we add up the total questions um, that were asked at the end and see um, what, how many you got right out of all of them. And some of the tests might have a few more questions than others. Um, often the third exam does have a couple more questions, maybe two or three more. So the, the question that the, the length of the test will be somewhere between say 48 and 52 questions. And you should have plenty of time to do them because you can take them during any 80 minute period within a three day range. Um, and it's open book, as you know. Um, but of course, that does not mean that you can't that you don't need to study. Um, if you do not study and try to look up every single answer to the uh, test, there's no way you'll be able to finish it. So it's critical that you do study um, and then use the extra time after you answer all the questions you do know to look up those uh, um, kind of more um, uh, you know, difficult uh, questions that you uh, um, weren't sure of the answer for. Um, again, everything's based on lecture and discussion. Um, you have your first discussion section tomorrow. That should be fun. Uh, your TAs have uh, worked very hard on the section material and they're, they're, um, they're gonna be designing these uh, uh, sections so that they're engaging and informative. And I've asked them to present material that will not be presented in lecture. So certainly there will be questions on the exam from tomorrow's discussion section on the first exam. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, I think that's pretty much said everything. Uh, just uh, so there's no confusion. The third exam will be held during finals week, but it will also be of the same format in that you will be given a three day range um, to take the test. Um, and uh, um, you'll again be given 80 minutes for that exam and it will not be cumulative. None of the exams are cumulative. 
Okay, let me take a quick second here and see if there's any questions on any of these uh, mechanics of the course. I see a lot of comments, uh, but I know most of them are saying uh, friendly good morning uh, comments. Um, no study guide. Yeah, you know, uh, well, we can talk a little bit more about that as the exam comes up. Um, I don't I don't do a study guide simply because it really would not be a study guide would really not be anything different from what's on the slides, which, the, you know, the slides have most of the critical terms. Um, so you really have a study guide from the slides, um, you know, since everything is from the lecture and discussion sections, nothing from the book, there really is no reason um, to do an extra study guide beyond what the, the slides provide. All right, what else? Um, do not know the dates of the tests. Um, it's just gonna be somewhere around, the first test will probably be sometime around week four. Um, again, uh, it's gonna be a three day range. So you'll have uh, certainly time uh, you know, you'll be able to take the exam at a convenient time. So, you know, if you're planning on being out of town, that's okay, because this is the one quarter you're able to do this, the last quarter, potentially, you could take the test from Bora Bora, wherever you're going. <laughs> it's an online exam. Okay. Uh, slides are posted on the exam. Yes, I'm Blackboard. Any questions? Any other questions about the mechanics of the course, though? Yeah, I'm not crazy about the lighting here. I'm in my office and I, I, I'll, bring a, I'll bring a fancy pants light so I'm a little bit more lit up next time, uh, but uh, yeah, it's not bad. Um, okay, get a ring light. I have a ring light. Thank you, Paulina. Um, I do have a ring light. The only problem with the ring light is when you wear glasses, it reflects the ring right back, but I, I figured out a way of angling it and I am planning on bringing that. Um, oh, I, oh, Mason, thank you. I look good. Um, uh, great. I was thinking of spraying on some hair today, but uh, I don't need to do that, obviously, says Mason. Um, the lecture slides are up. You'll find, you'll find the slides. Go ahead and play with the iLearn page sometime um, when you get a chance. You'll find everything you need there, um, including um, the slides and... Uh, um, oh, the, the, link, I, I, the, the link for the YouTube videos is in one of your announcements, obviously. I sent that out last week. All right, cool, great, thank you. Um, and I think we are ready to continue with our intro discussion to perception. So we'll finish this introduction to perception quickly and then we'll start getting into the history um, and some of the philosophy behind perception. I think, uh, well, hopefully you'll enjoy it. I'll enjoy it um, and that's what counts. All right, let's go back here. Okay, so uh, let's uh, remind ourselves where we left off. Um, I was talking about all the reasons I love perception so much as a topic to teach. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is because I feel that perception as a topic, as a, an area of interest kind of lies at the intersection of at least three different sciences. Um, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as a sub branch of psychology, of course, but it lies at the uh, um, intersection of biology, because certainly we're going to be learning uh, a little bit about the uh, um, uh, biological background that's necessary to understand perception. And I, I did say last week that I thought um, Psych 110 was a prerequisite. I guess it's not. I guess I, they either changed it um, um, or I'm confused, and that's very often the case. But no, it is not a prerequisite, I understand. But um, you will be learning about the detailed physiology of the senses in that course, which will be one of your uh, required courses for the major. Um, and so I will not be covering that in this course. We will be going over a little bit of it, um, just so we kind of have a basis to discuss some of the interesting research and, and theories about each sense. Um, but certainly it's an important part of perceptual psychology. You know, um, um, when we write papers uh, in the laboratory, we have to discuss the, the neuroscience behind what we think is going on and, and the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, whether that's at the, the deep brain area or the, the periphery at the, the level of the, the vision or auditory systems like we study in our lab. Um, you know, it's really an important part of, of what we do in, in perceptual research. Um, but so is physics. And that's not something that people often think about when they consider perception. Um, and we talked about that in two ways last class. We talked about uh, it being important to understand what the, the physical dimensions are of the 
the light and sound and mechanical pressure on our skin, that really is constructing the information that our senses use, right? So to understand what the brain does when it comes to perception, we need to understand what the eye does when it comes to perception. And to understand what the eye does, we need to know what the information out in the world is that the eye is going to pick up on. Obviously it's light, but what's the right description of the light? How do we, can we just borrow all of our understanding of light from classical physics um, and understanding photons and things like that? Or do we need a different type of just physical description of light? And it's something that we do need to, to keep, a, keep in mind as we go through our understanding of theories of perception. The other part of physics that I think you're gonna find interesting that will be appealing to is um, borrowing concepts of physics to see if we can understand the brain and the mind. Um, and we'll see that fairly soon, next week, uh, if not Thursday, we'll see a theory of perception that's going to borrow um, aspects of what's called field theory, having to do with magnetic and electrical fields to see if we can understand how the brain works with those same principles. And so, yes, we'll be understanding physics from the perspective of what the, the light energy is and sound energy, but also kind of some theoretical physics um, to see if maybe we can borrow those kind of big concepts to understand perception. I, I'm always, I mean, you know, in my, in my thinking, I'm always really kind of attracted to, to theories that, that can kind of appear in multiple sciences, you know, theories of, of how the mind works that um, are kind of consistent with theories of how things in physics work and how things in biology work. Um, I think that's a really, really kind of interesting way of going about thinking of, about psychology in some ways. And, you know, what I just did, you know, just kind of being, you know, a little imaginative about theories of, you know, perception and psychology and borrowing from physics, that was actually a move that, that philosophy often does. Um, and that's something else we're going to be spending time talking about, how perception is uh, intersecting with philosophy, um, you know, thinking about philosophies of science. So can we think about, you know, explanations in physics being borrowed for explanations in psychology? That's a question of philosophy. Can we think about the mind as something consistent with the other th sciences? Is the mind separate from the brain? Can the mind truly know things in the outside world? You know, these are kind of science fiction-y sort of questions, and I, you know, that it's all all fun um, for us to uh, to you know watch. What they have series like like a Black Mirror, maybe you're a fan, or the various Star Trek um, uh, series that sometimes touch on these things, whether um, artificial brains, whether you know machines can have a true understanding of the world. All these things are fun to think about. I, I still, you know, after all these years, love thinking about this. But when it comes to perception, these aren't just fun kind of mind games. These are actually things that are going to be very relevant to our understanding of perception as a matter of being in contact with the outside world. And so you'll see right away, uh, as soon as we start talking about some of this history, we will be talking about philosophy in, in some very interesting ways. Sometimes we, we kind of skip this stuff in psychology courses, and I, I don't like doing that. I like to make sure we go back to what's called the first principles of the science, you know, thinking about what our assumptions are before we kind of go into some of the research, before we go into some of the understanding of the neurophysiology. I'd like to kind of step back and say, what are the philosophical assumptions we're bringing into the science? You'll see what I mean by that as we go through. I'm just trying to get you primed for a kind of big picture of thinking. It's gonna be that type of class. It's gonna be a forest class, not a, not a trees class in, in that sense, okay? All right, before we get into that though, we'll, we'll get a little bit more practical and, and, and talk about some of the application of sub perceptual research. And these are things I think that maybe more than ever we are made aware of, you know, with all the technologies that we're faced with daily and, and how to multitask with these technologies and how to, you know, not be distracted as we're driving and all this sort of stuff. You know, we become very aware that 
that um, perception plays a very important role in what we can and can't do. And this is something certainly that the folks that design our technologies are you know, always looking to. They always look towards perceptual research to understand what's going on. So um, we'll be talking also about uh, throughout the quarter about prosthetic devices. And, and prosthetic devices are just devices that have um, been designed to help people with sensory losses. So on the top right there, you're seeing um, kind of an outline of uh, uh, technology that's been with us now for what, 30 years or so. And these are cochlear implants where somebody with deafness can be um, uh, a, a kind of made to hear, you know, something like, you know, regular speech sounds um, by having something uh, implanted into the, the deep part of their ear, right, where the uh, nerves kind of are, are um, affected mechanically. Um, they can be uh, electrically stimulated um, with this, uh, this device um, based on how sound is transduced into that device. And I see there's some hands raised now. I'll, I'll definitely get to those questions in just a second. Um, uh, they're, I'm sure they're important relative to this. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you down here is the um, uh, much newer technology of retinal implants, um, where something kind of analogous to uh, a cochlear implant is uh, put into the, uh, the retina to stimulate the cells in the back of the eye directly based on a transducer that's you know, taking in light information and kind of transducing that into electrical stimulation. I should say we are nowhere near um, um, getting these to have the, the sort of, um, I guess, practical utility that we have with cochlear implants. Cochlear implants have been used for, as I said, decades now. Um, by the way, um, uh, there's a, a terrific movie. It's, it's a little intense, I, I should warn you, just to make sure you uh, are, are, are aware before you're going into it. But um, The Sound of Metal, which was, a, 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 I think, Academy Award winner last year uh, for something. It's a really interesting movie. is about somebody who um, uh, goes spontaneously deaf, uh, which does happen, um, and uh, has to make a decision about whether or not to get a cochlear, cochlear implant and, and what the ramifications um, both kind of technologically, uh, socially, and emotionally are for that decision. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, I recommend it. It is an intense movie. It's, it's, the main character is also a, um, a, a kind of a recuperating drug uh, addict. So, I mean, just so you know, but if you're interested, it's it's really nicely done um, from, for somebody that knows a little bit about the technology and what it would seem like for a person. They do a very nice job. Um, uh, what else? Um, oh, training programs for the blind. You're gonna learn in the uh, quarter that there are ways of helping the blind um, and certainly uh, the deaf um, that don't involve these technologies to more um, effectively get around um, using their other senses. And perceptual research has always been very useful for you know, that field and for the individuals who are doing the training. Um, they often look to, to um, uh, the research in um, you know, how senses compensate for each other in order to uh, uh, understand the best way to do these training uh, programs. Um, and then human factors engineering, which is really how I started off this slide, which was talking about um, designing iPhones, designing uh, car cockpits. As you're seeing there, there's a Prius cockpit. I don't think that's even the most recent one. That's pretty close. Uh, I have a Prius and I think mine is a little different from that. But the amount of information now that is presented at pretty much eye level or close to eye level is so different from the car I learned to drive in on back in the in the 70s. Um, uh, and, you know, it has to be designed well and they want to provide as much information as possible, but it has to be um, designed in a way that is not going to be distracting and is going to provide the most important information um, um, in a, a most salient way. So it kind of pops out and, and you can see here, you know, the most salient information is things like the, the information for how fast you're going and um, what else is there? Um, you know, what gear you're in when you shift the gear, um, uh, whether you're going in reverse or forward and that sort of thing. And there is this information here about your car efficiency, uh, your, you know, your, your driving efficiency in terms of gas usage. 
Um, but they have to make sure that it's there, but not in a distracting manner. And so they're very careful in how they design these things and also how they put you know, the controls on the steering wheel. And all of that is based on perceptual research as well. So when you, you know, encounter new technology, and you know, I sometimes it, it, you know, I think we're very aware when it does it's distracting or you know, it, it just isn't as user friendly as it should be. Um, that often involves not looking at the perceptual research if it's not designed well. Um, okay, uh, let's continue and uh, talk about other applications of perceptual research. Uh, perceiving machines, and this is a big one now. Um, you know, I've uh, I used to work in a lab that um, had a machine that was designed to read that the first machine that was designed in the fifties uh, to read text and then translate it into spoken language. Um, you know, it was there as a museum piece. I wasn't there in the fifties. Um, I was there in the eighties. Uh, but um, it, it was, it took a long time for them to get that working. Now, of course, this is something that works, you know, automatically. We, we have perceiving machines on our phones, on our watches, um, not only in terms of uh, devices that recognize our speech, but also cameras that can recognize objects. Um, so this is something that we encounter every day, but it certainly wasn't the case and took a long time, especially for speech to design these devices. And, and the reason it took a while is a, a very interesting story we'll learn later in the quarter. But other things, um, uh, robotics, of course, trying to design robots um, that can be self-sufficient and navigate the, uh, the visual world um, you know, without uh, damaging themselves, without bumping into things, without you know, potentially injuring users. Um, teleoperation, which is something that's uh, been very important for the last 20 years, and that you know, um, if there's say a, a, an earthquake someplace and the building collapses and the building is too unstable for rescue workers to go in, very often what they will do, or in addition to rescue workers, they will use um, a uh, little robot that is controlled remotely, um, usually by somebody who's sitting in a truck down the street. Um, and perceptual research goes into designing these remote control robots. Um, so uh, these robots can get the best possible information to the controller, um, given the, the constraints of it having to be low to the ground and being built in a way that it, it's, it's very, very sturdy. You can see on this robot, for example, there are two um, cameras and that allows the um, uh, controller back in the truck to wear um, basically virtual reality goggles to, to see what the robot's seeing. The fact that there are, are two cameras going to the controller's two eyes makes it a much more usable device and provides a lot more information than there was a single camera uh, going to the controller. Um, and we'll talk about that sort of thing. Um, and of course, virtual reality. And, um, you know, I imagine many of you have virtual reality systems at home in your bedroom or your living room so you can play games. Um, you know, my older son is really into video games. He does not have one of these, but certainly his, his friends do. And some of these work pretty well, or well enough to, to uh, you know, be engaging for, for um, you know, gamers. Um, and uh, it's not something certainly I grew up with. It's, uh, uh, it took a long time, I know, to make sure that when um, the uh, user turned their head that the world turned with it because boy, if it doesn't, uh, or if it's a little lagging, you can get very nauseous very quickly. I used to you know, kind of help test these things out a little bit and yeah, it has to be done very, very well. But all of this um, is based on very, very basic perceptual research, of course, in this case, having to do with how the eyes coordinate with um, our balance system, that sort of thing. Um, and then speech recognition, which is one of my areas, and we'll, we'll be talking about the, the history of that, um, why it's been so difficult. It took a long, long time to design Siri well enough so it could understand our speech. And you know, it's still not perfect. It's fun to see what Siri, what type of mistakes Siri makes. There's websites dedicated to in, embarrassing uh, uh, misinterpretations of Siri. Why is that so difficult? Why are we so much better at understanding speech than Siri even now after so many years of, of engineering ha have gone into to designing, to designing Siri? 
Um, so we're going to look towards the engineering solutions to perceptual problems, but, but I want to emphasize, and we will emphasize this throughout the quarter, that when we think of a device like Siri being able to recognize our speech, at least to some degree, like I, I, a usable degree, um, does that mean that that's giving us insight in, into how our brains perceive speech? Um, when we um, find that we can design robots um, that are able to interpret a scene well enough to navigate a cluttered room without bumping into something, um, does that mean that the solution the engineers came up with are the same solutions that nature came up with in designing our visual system? And, and we're going to find there's instances where that's not the case, that the engineering solution is pretty good for what they want to do. But often you find that engineering solutions are very restricted to specific circumstances where we our brains and animals' brains overall seem much more flexible for the most part. So even though it's kind of cool to look at these perceiving devices, these perceiving machines to get a, a sense of um, how we might perceive the world, in some ways it can be useful. It's not necessarily and often going to be very um, unrelated to how our brains work. Okay. Um, but it does help motivate questions. And that's what I like to do, is to motivate good questions. So, you know, um, I know you take courses to, to, to get some answers on how things work, right? To, to try to, um, uh, you know, have things that, you know, facts, you know, I know we love facts when we take classes. I want to learn the facts of perception. And I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, this ain't a facty class. And that, that's why I said it might be a little different for you when it comes to studying. I do not want you to memorize facts. I want you to understand questions in this class. It's very different. I love questions. I just love questions, especially when they're good questions, right? So, so you, may, you may have heard the adage, there's no such things as stupid questions. Right? You, I don't know if you've ever heard that. Did you share it? And you say, I've got a stupid question. Well, there's no such thing as stupid questions. Maybe there are. But what I really like are the, a specific type of stupid question. A question that makes no assumptions about how something in nature works. That kind of goes back to the very fundamental heart of the question. Okay, so that you'll see me going throughout the quarter saying, that's a beautifully stupid question. That's a beautiful, my, my, my old graduate advisor used to say that to me, he's a Rosenblum, that's a wonderfully stupid question. It took me a while to understand what he meant. I thought, oh boy, uh, maybe I shouldn't be in grad school, right? But what he means by that and what I mean that by that are questions that make no assumptions. And I'll show you what I mean. So. Um, I can ask this question. Now, I, I know that you're, you're chatting and, and raising hands and stuff. And let me just get through these next few slides and then we'll take some time and answer your hopefully stupid questions. So here's a question, basic question of the course, right? How do we perceive, right? Um, and you could come up with a, a real quick answer, right? Your quick answer could be, um, well, our brain, um, you know, uh, uh, does some calculations uh, about what's out in the world and then comes up with some guesses and there we go, we've perceived. Um, okay, that's simple enough, right? But in that answer, there's a lot of assumptions. First, there's an assumption that the brain needs to kind of construct something about our reality, that the brain needs to kind of um, interpret input to the senses, the eyes, the ears, that is insufficient. And so even in that kind of very plain answer, I came to it with some assumptions. And I don't like assumptions, not when it comes to that sort of thing. I want to start even more stupid. And the, the word stupid, I don't think is probably the best word. I'm, I'm kind of using that to be kind of funny. 
What I mean here is kind of clean or naive. You know, naive can be sometimes a very positive thing. It's not, it's not the same as ignorant, right? Naive can be, let's not make any assumptions about what's going on. Let's come to it with a very open mind and then slowly build up what we think is going on. So the, the way I like to think about it is this. That's not stupid enough. My, my question is, how do we perceive? Because that, that led to a kind of, kind of, you know, kind of intricate answer that involved a lot of assumptions. So that, I don't like that question as much as what might lie behind it. So this one, why do we perceive? All right, why do we perceive? What's the point of perception? What's the point of seeing the world? What's the point of hearing and touching and smelling and tasting the world? And imagine, you know, I, I like to think about this as my kids when they were really young. I don't know, maybe six, seven years old. They say, Daddy, what do you study? I say, I study perception. And I say, how do we perceive? And I, you know, I'll come up with some brain thing. I say, well, why do we perceive, Daddy? And my first answer, without thinking about it too much, might be something like, well, we perceive in order to see colors and see shapes, to hear sounds, you know, that sort of stuff. That's why we perceive. And then my six-year-old would say, okay, well, what's the point of seeing colors and seeing shapes and hearing sounds, right? What's, what's, why would I need to do that? Because they're pretty? No, no, because we need to know what's out there. So my, my six-year-old saying, why? And I'm saying, because we need to know what's in the world. We need to know that there's chairs and there's, you know, food and that there's parents and friends and all that great stuff. We need to know that those things are out there. So it's great to know those things are out there, Dad, but why do we need to know those things are out there, right? It's not, it's not a clean enough answer for my six-year-old, right? Say, so, well, it's a good point. We need to know those things are out there in order for us to safely be, I'm sorry, yeah, safely behave relative to the things that are out there. We need to behave successfully and safely, okay? We need to be able to stay away from things that cause us harm um, and move towards things that might benefit us, um, whether it's food, whether it's you know, uh, um, someone that can help us like a parent or someone that, that we can have fun with like a friend. Okay? We need to perceive, we need to behave successfully and perception allows us to do that, right? Um, and so that's really a clean way of answering my six-year-old's question. Why do we perceive? Well, we need to perceive to support our successful behavior. And look where we've gone with this. This is, this is why I like this dumb question idea, is that by kind of making the question a little dumber than how we perceive and talking about the why question, and then not just answering superficially the why question about hearing sounds and seeing shapes and colors and stuff like that, or even seeing things out in the world. We need to remind ourselves that perception is for supporting behavior, successful behavior, so we don't get hurt and we survive and we procreate and make healthy offspring and all that sort of stuff. So any ideas we have, any theories we have on how we perceive is going to need to address that somehow without, you know, if nothing else, any of these other assumptions about the mind as a computer or as a, an information processor or holding representations or anything like that, we must come back to that purpose of perception, which is to support successful behavior. Cool. Okay. Another stupid question, what do we perceive, right? Better than how we perceive. Um, well, I can say the same type of answer. So my six-year-old goes, dad, what do we perceive in the world? And I can say colors and shapes and sounds like I did before, kinda. I say, well, um, that's not really that useful, is it dad? I say, you're right, you're right. We need to perceive the things that are in the world, which are objects like chairs and, and food and, and mom and dad and all that cool stuff. I said, well, yeah, that's important, but I think really the important stuff, my six-year-old now is being very precocious. <laughs> six-year-old saying, the important stuff is 
we need not just perceive the objects in the world, but we need to understand what sorts of behaviors the objects allow us to do, how we behave towards objects. So my six-year-old is taking a cue from how I ultimately answered that previous question of why. Why do we perceive? To behave successfully. So what do we perceive? We perceive the things in the world, but more than that, we need to perceive what behaviors these things allow, what behaviors these things prevent, right? So whatever we're perceiving is not just objects in the world, but objects in terms of how we can behave towards them. So we can say this, we must perceive things in the world and how we can behave towards them. And any theory of perception is gonna to have to deal with this as well. I mean, at this point, it might seem kind of self-evident, right? But what we're talking about here is something pretty deep. We don't just perceive colors. We don't just perceive objects. We perceive things in the world and what they allow us to do with them. In other words, we perceive meaning. We perceive what things mean to us, whether it's a stake, whether it's an ambulance approaching us from behind as we're driving and we know what we need to do. We need to get out of the way immediately. You know how hard it can be sometimes not knowing where it's coming from, all right? We need to not just perceive what's in the world, but at the same time, and as fundamentally, we need to know, we need to perceive what these things mean to us. And that's the sort of thing we're gonna be concentrating on throughout the quarter. And in a more general way, we're going to be kind of stepping back at various times as we're going through some of the kind of technical stuff about the eye or the ear or you know skin, et cetera. We're gonna step back and make sure we're reminding ourselves of what the ultimate goal of our understanding of perception at any level needs to take us to, which is what in the world we perceive and what it means to us. We perceive meaning in the world and our understanding at all levels of perception need to help us get to understanding that, okay? You know, I like to say here, you're not gonna learn a lot of facts. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll spread some facts around just so you have stuff to talk to your friends about at parties. I, I'm sure you do. You talk about your, your classes and all that stuff at all your, your parties. Well, if you go to a psychology party, right? Uh, you can talk about some fun facts. We'll give you some of those, no problem. But what I really want you to do is fall in love with the questions, right? Because if a question is well phrased, if it's, if it's designed in a pure way, in kind of a naive way, in almost a childlike way that allows us to be open-minded about how we move towards the answers, then it can be very, very effective. All right. Let's take a little break here and I will answer your questions. I'm sorry it took so long. I wanted just to get through the introduction, um, but let's take our break here and, uh, and chat for a little bit. Okay, who had their hand up? Uh, sorry about this. How do I do that? Uh... Uh, that was me. Okay, thank you. Um, what's it called? I was just wondering if it was possible to do the closed captions or the subtitles during lecture as well. Sure. It's just I've sometimes like when the professor is speaking and like we miss something, the subtitles are still there so we can like refer back just even sure. a little bit. I believe yeah. they, they, they go on to the YouTube uh, videos, right? The, the subtitles, but I can, I can try to do that. Okay, thank you for asking. Let's see. So um, I will type, uh, how do I do this? Assign someone to type? No, I'm not gonna assign someone to type. I will not be typing my lectures. Um, use a third party service. Copy this token and paste it into it. Oh. Okay. I don't know how to do this. How about I do it first thing next class? Is that okay? Because um, I've never done this before. Oh, okay. Somebody actually put something in chat. Maybe that can help. Sorry about this. Um, okay. There is a feature that lets you do it do CC. 
Okay, I just, there's a closed captioning button here, but it says I have to use a third party CC service. Um, okay, uh, I'm sorry, there, there also are apps. Does anybody, I mean, has anyone used the, the um, maybe the closed captioning app or something like that? Has anyone done this themselves that they could quickly help me with? If, if it's a, if it's a multi-step process, I'll do it for next class. But if this is a very simple thing and you know how to do it and you've done it, it'd be great if you, you piped in right now and, and told me how to do it. Anyone? Yeah, so the closed captioning thing looks like I have to go through some sort of process and I will do that for next class. Sorry, um, I will um, set that up. I've never done that before. Okay, but I will definitely do it for next class. Sorry about that, Nancy, we'll do it for next class. Okay, let's look at some other questions people might have. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. Can you explain teleoperators so that robots go check? Yeah, so basically um, uh, teleoperators are nothing more than remote control. So uh, the, the kind of prime example of a tele teleoperator that you might have at home is, uh, what you call it? Um, oh boy, I can't believe I, uh, drones, right? Um, the little helicopters that you send out with the cameras and they can spy on your neighbors and all that sort of stuff. That's exactly a title operator because that's a robot that you're controlling with the levers. Um, and um, uh, you know, you're know you able to control based on what that device is seeing in its camera. You're able to see it on your phone or your remote controller. It's exactly what we're talking about. Um, with regard to robots that are sent into um, dangerous environments like a, a, a collapsed building, um, it's basically the same thing, except it, it, it rolls on the ground, as you saw in that image. Um, it very often has treads rather than tires, and that makes it um, you know, very maneuverable and also makes it very durable, just in case something does fall on it. Um, and it's just a, a really nice way to allow for the search of, say, survivors, of people trapped, um, um, without endangering uh, uh, people going in until they have to go in to save somebody. Um, so it's just a remote control, you know, it's basically somebody has a joystick or a steering wheel back in a, a van down the street and they are, they are working the uh, robot um, safely, okay? Uh, other things that people wanted to ask about, anything? Okay, great, no problem. What we will do is we will then start on our next part of the lecture and then we will take a break. And at our next break, um, I will ask a practice question. It will be our first practice question of the uh, quarter. Um, so we'll look forward to that. Okay, let me just very quickly change our slides. And uh, here and start sharing again. Okay. So um, what we're going to do is actually start with um, some topics in the history of perceptual psychology that are going to nicely intersect with philosophy. So, you know, if you've been doubting that we're going to actually do philosophy in the course, here's your proof. Um, so, uh, and I know this is, you know, probably new for a lot of you. Oh, someone else raised a hand. Oh, um, or is this the hand from before? All right, all right, I'll get into it. If a hand comes up, then we'll, we'll uh, get it afterwards. All right, so yes, we are gonna be talking about philosophy by talking a little bit about the history of, of uh, perceptual psychology. So what we're gonna do is start with um, uh, some uh, real you know, uh, old history um, where um, some philosophers who you uh, may have heard of thought about a very fundamental question. And by the way, I, I love this question. So here's our philosophy. So, you know, when we intersect with philosophy, when we intersect biology um, and physics, I'll put a little circle there just to remind you of how, you know, how cool it is that we're actually talking about another, another um, area of interest at this point. Now we're talking about philosophy, but we're talking about philosophy by starting with a beautifully stupid question. Again, I know this is a stupid question that my, my old graduate advisor used to ask me, Rosenblum. I don't want to know how the brain acts like a computer. I don't want to know how, how the brain kind of sets up representations of the world based on impoverished on the, uh, impoverished information in the senses. I want to know something much dumber. I want to know how light gets into muscle. 
And what, did you, what do you mean by that? You know, we know light doesn't get into muscle. He goes, in a way it does, right? Because these are things we know about. We know that there's light out here and there's muscles in here that control the body so that they can interact with the world based on this light. But let's not make any assumptions about what happens between the light and the muscle. You know, we know that there's physiology in between these things, but let's not make any assumptions about the processes um, that the physiology works with. Let's start just with knowing there's light and knowing there's muscles that are going to control the body and start from there. Beautifully stupid. Boy, it doesn't get much stupid than that. And you know how I feel about that. So let's go into some of this old history and talk about some of the ancient Greeks. Pythagoras, you probably remember that name from the Pythagorean theorem. And, you know, these guys, of course, were very often, um, uh, you know, multifaceted. Um, and so not only was Pythagoras a, a mathematician, um, he was a philosopher, but he was also kind of a, a you know, thought, thought about scientific things and, and he wanted to understand perception. And he came up with something called the emanation hypothesis. This was his explanation for perception, one of the earliest explanations for how perception worked. And I should mention here, as we talk about history, we're mostly going to be talking about visual perception. Okay. Um, we'll discuss why that's the case, but the general ideas that we apply in visual perception when we're talking about history and philosophy should apply to the other senses. But Pythagoras now is going to help us with visual perception, as most of these folks will. Pythagoras's idea was this, that when you opened your eyes and looked at the world, okay, um, your eyes sent out almost like beams or little messengers that made contact with the things in the world and returned to the eyes to tell the person with the eyes what's out in the world. And so that's why it was called emanation, that, that the light essentially emanated from our eyes didn't think of it as light necessarily. He knew that there was a sun and, and you know, candles and all that stuff. Um, but he thought that the important things were like the eyes, when we opened them, sent out messengers like, you know, reconnaissance, reconnaissance is that the right word? Um, uh, soldiers that went out and, and tried to determine what was out there and then came back to the eyes and then whatever was, you know, in the body that could have then interpreted um, that was out there. So, you know, there was an emanation from the eyes, essentially. Um, uh, but one thing, that, so we know that's now, you know, we know that light doesn't come from the eyes. We know that it comes from the sun and candles and light bulbs and all that sort of thing. But one feature of the emanation hypothesis that was kind of maintained through modern history was the idea that as these things, as these, these, um, I guess, little messengers, these little soldiers that came back to the eyes um, uh, were um, carrying information that were kind of copies of the world. Okay? So the emanation really has to do with you know, going out there from the eyes, but then on its return, the, the you know, whatever sorts of little devices that were involved in you know, the returning um, carried copies of the things in the world. And these copies then came back to the eyes and then were interpreted um, by the body. Of course, we would think it's the brain, but you know, they were talking about the body interpreting um, these copies of the world. And that's what Pythagoras told us. Democritus kind of fine-tuned this a little bit and he said, no, there's nothing emanating from the eyes, Pythagoras. However, you did get one thing right, and that is that, yeah, light comes down and reflects off of the things in the world. And there are copies in the light that get into the eye. And that's his idea of the idola hypothesis. Basically, an idola is just a copy of something. Um, and what he's saying is Pythagoras to give something right in a way 
that um, there are copies. It's not a messenger bringing back a copy, but there are copies of things. So right now, as I look over all the, the, the cute little doggies and the grass and all the, the trees in front of me, you know, I'm in my office, right? Um, there are, according to Democritus, there are copies of those things in the light that, that, are, that are getting into my eye. So that's the idola, the little copies in the light. And both of that, that, that idea, you know, both of these theories have this idea of there being some sort of copy of the tree that's in front of me, that's in the light, of the doggy that's running around in the light, okay? Is a way of saying that the light holds a simulation of the world for us. That there's a simulation in the light that comes into the eye of what's out in the world. And that idea is part of most modern theories of perception. We can call it the simulative assumption. Though there's, a, yeah, I should have put this up earlier. There's just a kind of a, a schematic of looking at a tree. And um, as you see the tree out here, it's going to get into the eye. But the way of thinking of the Idola hypothesis is that there is a copy of the tree constructed in the light that goes to the eye, a copy or a simulation of the tree. So this is a term, the simulative assumption that we're going to borrow from Democritus and in some ways Pythagoras too, don't wanna to leave him out, that there is a simulation, there is a copy of aspects of the world in the light that come to the eye. And that is an idea that most modern theories of perception, most theories we'll be talking about in this class, kind of make. Okay? They make an assumption that, you know, what's in the light is a copy of things in the world. Right? That's the simulative assumption. That the, you know, if you were to take kind of a, a cross section, you know, if I were to cut right here, if I were to cut right here, then, and then look at what the light looks like, I would see a copy, it would be like a two-dimensional copy of at least the surface of the tree that's facing me. Okay. So that is an assumption I'm making about the light. Doesn't necessarily have to be absolutely correct when it comes to what the light is detecting, as we'll see, but it is, an assumption that most modern theories make, that this is what the light is going to give the eye. Remember I said here, right, that we're gonna be talking about different theories of what's going on. And I'm saying that many theories assume that this is basically the stimulus for vision, that there's kind of a two-dimensional copy in the light of the things or the surfaces of the things that get to the eye, okay? That's the simulative assumption. I'm gonna add something to this. Um, it, it really, it's not as important as the simulative assumption, but you should know that it goes on to say, most theories make this assumption too, that that copy then gets into the eye. Basically, it just gets to the back of the eye. It's projected into the back of the eye, just simply based on how the eye is constructed. So that copy in the world, that simulation of the world, gets projected to the back of the eye. So that second part of it is just called the projective assumption. The projective assumption just says that that copy that's in the light that comes to the eye gets projected to the back of the eye where you know the neurophysiology starts, okay? That's all back here is where the, the neurons are, right? You probably knew that from your 10th grade health class, right? Um, so the simulative assumption is talking about the light. The projective assumption is talking about the, the physiology here of the eye and then potentially bringing it to the, the neurons in the back of the eye. Projective assumptions, simulative assumptions out here. And I'm assuming you can see my arrows I'm pointing. Okay, cool. All right. Now, as I said, um, even though this is old history with Pythagoras and Democritus, these are modern concepts that have been borrowed from these folks to a great degree. All right, um, now we're gonna jump up into um, the Renaissance, okay? Um, and talk about some other philosophers. Um, 
Uh, and um, without naming them, I, I actually do want to actually um, before we do, okay, we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna introduce a concept that's not just about the Renaissance philosophers. It's actually relevant to the ancient Greeks as well. And it's this idea. Okay, let's go ahead and make the, let's run with the simulative and projective assumption. I'm going to tell you right now, not all theories of perception are going to buy into that assumption, but most do. So let's run with that. So there's a simulation of uh, the things in the world that are in the light, and that simulation gets projected onto the back of the eye. Once it gets projected onto the back, back of the eye, what happens? And you know, back in the ancient Greek days, they really didn't know very much. They said, well, somehow the body interprets it, or there's something in the body that interprets it. They, you know, at that point didn't know much about what was going on physiologically, neurophysiologically, of course. But they said somehow there is a, a, an agent that's part of the body, maybe that then gives the mind or something that information. The idea that there's a little interpreter inside the body, okay, or inside the mind for that matter, is an idea that is also maintained in an interesting way through modern um, theory. It is the idea of homunculus. I don't know if you've ever heard this term before. It's used, it's sometimes used to talk about maps on the brain, but we're not going to use it like that right now. We're going to use it as it was originally intended to be used. And the, it was the idea that there's something like a little agent, a little person, we'll just kind of make it fanciful, right? There's a little person somewhere in the brain that, um, or in, you know, in the body that interprets the image on the eye. Okay, the image on the back of the eye, the, you know, what's projected onto the back of the eye. Okay, so I got a picture of that. There we are. Okay, there's my bald head looking at um, a tree. Uh, the tree is out in the world. I probably should have made a little tree in here too. So you get the idea that there's a simulation of the surface of that tree, right? In the light, our friend, the simulative assumption that then gets projected to the back of the eye, our projective assumption. We're assuming that that's what happens. Okay. That, that that simulation, that kind of that kind of 2D sliced image of the world gets projected onto the back of the eye. And somehow then this image needs to be interpreted. Okay. We're saying from the perspective of the ancient Greeks, they said, yeah, it's like an agent, uh, um, a little a little person back there does some type of interpretation. There you go. There it is. Uh, something like a little rose in bloom, also bald back there doing an interpretation of the image on the back of the eye, All right? Cool, all right, that's great. Does that explain it? Well, I could say eh, if we're talking about something like a little person, a little agent back there, um, then we're gonna have to explain at some point how that little person is able to interpret the information it's getting. So that interpreter kind of needs uh, an interpreter, right? And say, okay, so let's give him a little interpreter that's maybe smaller, um, maybe not a, I don't know, maybe, um, you know, somehow is fitting in to that little agent somehow or something like that. And you know where this is going, right? This could go on forever and ever. And I don't think I can draw them any smaller than that. But what we're talking about with this type of explanation is a problem. It's a problem that we're not really explaining how, in this case, perception works. If, in fact, we're trying to bring in some sort of interpreter that itself needs to be explained, right? So, so if I say, and I'm just, you know, kind of, you know, kind of making the, the ancient Greeks seem, you know, not as sophisticated as they are, say, well, there's an agent that does the interpretation of the image. And that's how it works. That agent is, is you know, some sort of sophisticated thing that's able to do the interpretation. Um, whether the agents, you know, something like a little, an analog to a little man or person, or if it's some sort of process, okay? It, that's the thing that does it. You say, well, then you've got to explain the interpreter. 
And then beyond that, you've got to explain that interpreter and on and on and on. This type of explanation isn't a very satisfying explanation because it kind of leads to what we call an infinite regress, right? Kind <laughs> of a dramatic term. Works best with that echo, infinite regress, right? Because what we're saying is we're not really explaining if we're saying that there's a, some sort of interpreter or process that is basically as sophisticated as the initial process we're trying to explain. We have to keep on saying that interpretation process needs some sort of interpretation and that sort of needs some sort of interpretation. And again, we're not saying that anyone now believes that there's a little agent inside the head or something analogous to a little agent um, or person inside the head. But when we say, when we turn and said and say that, Oh, it's because some sort of process in the neurophysiology is, in do, is doing the interpretation. We have to be careful not just to leave it there. We have to go deep in and understand why that process or that kind of computation that's done by the nervous system or by you know, some sort of you know, uh, computational mathematical you know, kind of analog that's you know, kind of supported by the nervous system. We have to make sure that we don't just leave it there. We have to explain that in a way that doesn't lead to this infinite regress. So this is a very well-known problem in the sciences and in philosophy called the homunculus. Right. And, and, you know, it, it, it can apply to everything. So um, how did the universe get here? Well, the Big Bang. OK, well, what caused the Big Bang? I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those sorts of things, too. Um, and then whether that re leads you to reach, you know, um, you know, physical, cosmological, religious sorts of next steps, we got to somehow deal with, you know, understanding how this can work without something that's not proceeding, right? It's the same type of thing. And it's very relevant to perception. It is so relevant to perception. We want to come up with solutions that don't lead to an infinite regress. We don't want to, for example, say, well, that's not the, per that's not the perceptual psychologist's job. That's the biologist's job. Um, even though I'm outside, I can tell you the biology building is right over here. Um, uh, and so I just need to get, I said, I went as far as I can. It's your job from here. We got to make sure that we're not leading to some sort of, you know, not making an assumption about an explanation that's not really a satisfying explanation. Okay. And that's the homunculus problem. All right. Let's talk now about the Renaissance and talk about our friend Descartes. And you've probably heard of his name before, right? Cartesian planes, uh, uh, Descartes, um, uh, I think, therefore I am, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but we're going to be most interested in Descartes' writing when it comes to understanding now how the mind and body are related, right? And this is a deep question, right? You know, this mind-body relationship. Um, uh, here is an example of how the mind is uh, uh, going to relate to the body. Rosenblum, lift your right hand like it's a marionette's hand. Okay, here we go. Right, I can do a little marionette stance. All right. Okay, what did I do there? I had an idea. Rosenblum, lift your hand like a marionette hand, and it caused something to occur in my body. An idea is something that exists in my mind, right? Yeah, there's brain stuff going on that's related to the idea. But I, I had an idea. I mean, I, I think it was my own idea that I thought of myself and was based on the free will of me choosing that idea. And somehow that idea caused something in my body. Yes, went through the neurophysiology and the muscles and all that stuff. But it was an idea, uh, uh, an idea that I came up with myself based on free will that somehow caused the body to do something. How do we kind of understand the relationship between an idea and what's going on in the body. And what Descartes said is, okay, this is a difficult question, but let's at least kind of outline where these things occur. And maybe the first thing we can talk about is a puppet, right? There's Descartes. Ah, see, now I'm jealous of his hair. Not his ideas, just his hair. No, I'm kidding. 
genius. Um, let's talk about a puppet. Yeah, so we can think of our bodies as, as, as kind of puppets that our minds are controlling, okay? Great movie, by the way, if you've an old movie, if you've never seen it, it's uh, uh, Being John Malkovich. It's all about this type of thing exactly and stars John Malkovich and somebody else takes, John Cusack, you know that actor, takes over his body. It's great, great, great movie, really fun. Um, but it's like that, right? Um, that it's now, you know, there's a little agent in there. There's a little agent that, that I say is Rosenblum that has free will, that makes his own decisions, and he's going to cause Rosenblum to dance like a little puppet. Okay, there. Descartes said, yes, that is absolutely one way the mind relates to the body, but in port, so let's get this down. The mind is a puppeteer. That's great. But there's another way that maybe is even... Well, it's just as important. We'll say it's just as important. And it is this. Not only does the mind influence the body. Right? I'm enjoying this today. Not only does the mind influence the body, but the um, body influences the mind. And it influences the mind in a very interesting way, right? So I reach out. I, I do my little puppet thing, and I reach out. Um, as Rosenblum, the, the marionette, and I touch something here that you can't see, but is here with my dog friends. It's a bottle of soda. Oh, there it is. Oh, <laughs> it's Green Street. It's, it's Mountain Dew. And I feel cold, right? The, bo the bottle's cold. My experience of cold is an experience of the mind, right? I, I have that experience, right? That is something that that I have consciously experienced right now. I've just attended to it, I'm conscious. My consciousness is an act that's a mind-related act. But what caused that to occur? What caused my awareness of cold, my consciousness of cold in my mind? It was something in the body, right? The, the coldness um, touches my skin, that looks invisible, that's cool. It touches my skin, and uh, affects you know, the, the little sensors uh, underneath the skin um, that then you know, stream up the, the neurons to my brain. And somehow that causes my awareness to be one of cold. So the body in this case is affecting the mind. The body influences the mind. And that's a way we can think about perception of all types, not just touch, but see, right? So when we go back to this example here, our awareness of a tree is one where the body is affecting the mind. The body is causing that awareness. It's influencing that awareness, right? Because there's something going on in the body, some change in the physiology and then the neurophysiology that causes a chain in, change in my psychological state. It's important I use that word there, by the way, psychological state, because this is not just perception. This is all of psychology. When you think about something, whether it's your fancy pants course, something in your fancy pants course is like, you know, uh, social psychology and you know, normal psychology, developmental psychology, and, you know, you're aware of the, you know, the, the, the facial expressions of your significant other, or you're aware of, you know, what your parents are telling you to do, and all that, you know, kind of fun stuff we learn in the other courses. We are, of course, being affected by the body, the sound of your parents' voices telling you to study more, okay, affects what's going on in the ear, and then we become somehow aware based on what's happening in the body, okay? And that's critical because what Descartes going to tell us is in fact, that's what awareness is. That's what psychology is, all of psychology, not just perception, okay? It's an awareness of body states. All of our awareness is an awareness of what's going on in the body. And what that means is, Okay, that we are not aware of what's going on outside. We are only aware of whatever is happening in the body, how that affects our awareness. Now, let's be very clear what we mean here. We're, I'm not aware that there, you know, I have no awareness that my, my um, ear is being, you know, part of my ear is being vibrated. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying any awareness that I have is a result 
of something that's happening in the body. And that's the doctrine of corporeal ideas. We gave it a fancy name, sorry. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's fun to say. Yeah, this, is, this is one you can throw around at a party. You, know, you can say, you know, um, hi, I'm um, Rosenblum. Um, uh, you know, I, I, you look, seem like an interesting person. Can I tell you about the doctrine of corporeal ideas? And now you'll be able to do that. Say, yeah, I got to go get a drink, right? But if they stick around, you say, well, it turns out Something Descartes told us, and something I think that you know, we need to think about philosophically, is that really we are only aware of what our body is telling us to be aware of. We're only aware based on how the body changes, how the body states change, whether it's a change in the neurophysiology, the brain, um, all that stuff. That's what our awareness is based on not what's going out in the world. Hopefully what's going on in the world is somehow affecting the body in a way that's going to be you know, um, consistent, but not always. What we, are awareness, what we are aware of, what our awareness is based on is just how the body has been affected by the world. That's all we're aware of. Again, think about it. When my parents you know, are telling me to clean my room, um, uh, the only reason that I'm able to have an awareness of that is because of something that's changed in my body. Same thing with vision, same thing with touch. So we are only in touch with how our body is affected by the outside world, which might sound familiar if you're, in fact, a fan of the Matrix. Hey, they're making a new one. Okay, great. So maybe I'm sure they'll deal with this too, right? So um, Neo, it's been a long time since I've seen these movies, um, right? Um, he learns that the world he is in is a simulation. It's not real, okay? Somehow these, you know, aliens or whatever they are, right? Learn to um, allow a simulation of the world to be derived from, you know, the, somehow the brain experiences everybody and are con trying to convince everybody's body that there is a real world out there by manipulating the body, right? So there it is, right? Neo has this thing plugged into the back of his head and that thing in the back of his head changes the, the way that, you know, the process of, of his body, change the, the, the brain sorts of processes in a way that convinces him that there's a real world out there, but there's not, right? I mean, there is a real world, but ain't nothing like the world he experiences. And this is a, you know, this is kind of based in a very deep, you know, philosophical question. How would we ever know whether we are in the world or experiencing the world or experiencing a simulation of the world. You know, the only way Neo could find out is he had to have Morpheus kind of take him through that whole thing, right? Um, whatever it is, the red pill or the blue pill or all that sort of stuff. But other than that, it's not clear how he would ever know because what we are aware of are, is, the, are, is just based on how our body is being affected by the outside world. And if our body can be affected in a way that simulates the outside world, in principle, we shouldn't be able to tell the difference. It's, it's kind of a provocative idea and it's, you know, it's been floating around forever, but the matrix did a nice job of making it kind of the underlying um, theme to the, the, the whole exciting story. Okay, let's take a break there, see if there's questions, and then we will go into our question of the day. Oops, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so Jenna asks, our world is a simulation? You know, you're going to have to tell me. <laughs> I, I Maybe it could be. I don't have any way of proving it is or it isn't. Um, and I don't think there is a very straightforward way of doing that. Um, the physical world and the world inside of our mind. Yeah, there's no way of, of really knowing um, whether we're, what we're in touch with, right? 
Um, the thing about if a tree falls, did it actually fall if we didn't perceive it? Exactly, it's the same type of thing. Now, we will get into um, why that is asked about sound and not light, which I think is a, a very interesting question that kind of distinguishes our assumptions about sound and light, right? Because that's that question is always asked, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? And it's not asked if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to see it, does it reflect light? But it, it is absolutely related to what we're talking about. But I think as you'll, as we understand light and sound, we'll understand some assumptions are made about those that are different that you know, kind of leads to that question being about sound. Very cool. Um, uh, right, our lives are just one big sim game. Uh, how do you feel, right, right? I mean, you know, it, it is one of those things that make your brain hurt, Jenna. I absolutely agree. Um, we can study. So what you're saying, we can study by watching The Matrix. Absolutely, watch watch The Matrix. Um, I'm not going to ask questions about the film, but if it helps you understand um, the kind of importance of the question, go for it. Yeah, those are fun films. Uh, that's why VR feels so real, right? Um, or it's beginning to feel more real, I would say. I think most of us can still tell the difference between VR and, and the outside world. But yeah, if you know VR, if it's done well, um, both with sound and sight and touch, I mean, that's you know, something they're continuing to do. They're continuing to bring these things in. Um, uh, so you, know, you get multi-sensory stimulation. It can seem more and more compelling. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Great, um, cool. Meg, I see your doggy, and that is one cute doggy. All right. Anyway, let's do our question of the day. We just have a few minutes left. So uh, here we go. So how I'm going to do this is I am first going to read the question, and then I'm going to have, um, I'm going to read it out loud, and then I'm going to give you a chance to answer it. Then I will show you the correct answer, and we will then um, talk about it a little bit. And then we gotta go a little fast here. So I'm gonna read quickly. According to, Pyth uh, to Pythagoras, the emanation hypothesis, uh, according to the Pythagoras, the emanation hypothesis, the light source comes from, I'm sorry, it's according to Pythagoras's emanation hypothesis. The light source comes from A, the eyes, B, the sun, C, the mind, or D, none of the above. And I'm using light source here uh, very loosely. Okay, so go ahead and answer that. And it has no bearing on your grade whatsoever. If you wanna intentionally put the wrong answer just because you're that type of person, go for it. No one's getting graded on this. Here we go. And I'll give you about 30 seconds or 45 seconds to answer. The answer is right in your notes, obviously. It's the slide before the current one. Most of you are getting it right away. And I'll give you another 10 seconds. It's okay if you don't answer it, no problem. What counts is that you get this question somehow into your notes. Okay, I am going to end the poll now and share the results. Now, this is a good time to take a screenshot um, because I believe, at least this was the case up and through last quarter, for some reason, the polling questions do not get recorded on the video, okay? So take a screenshot or however else you like to get this down, the correct answer, which 95% of you got is A, the eyes. And, and the idea is for, for um, Pythagoras that, that you know, whether you want to call this light or call it little messengers or whatever, um, something leaves the eyes, it goes out into the world, you know, kind of makes contact with the things in the world and then comes back to the eye and tells the body, tells the person um, what's out in the world. So yes, that's what's emanating. It's something from the eyes in the case of Pythagoras. Okay, so the correct answer is A. Again, if you haven't yet, take a, a screenshot of that. Um, and that will be one of the questions on your first exam. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop sharing now and see if you folks have any questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Eyes, 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 eyes. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, then we will see you on Thursday and, and have a fun time in discussion section tomorrow. Bye-bye.